Bruchem Aboim, thank you very much for coming. Welcome to our home. And uh, we are in the middle of a uh, two-part series on clothes. And uh, again, we began last week, again, looking at both the um, secular purpose of clothes and also the origin of clothes dating back to Adam, first man. And we'd like to continue again with the progression of clothing through the Torah. We see that clothing played an important part in Yosef's life. It was clothing that contributed to his being sold into slavery and incarceration. The Kasonis Pasin, the cloak of many clothes, colors that his father gave him, only brought more hatred from his brothers. The brothers stripped him of this garment and sold him into slavery in Egypt. They dipped his cloak in the blood of a sheep and presented it to their father. Seeing the bloody and torn garment, Yaakov surmised that Yosef must have been killed by a wild animal. Now, while a slave in Egypt, Yosef's mistress tried to seduce him constantly, but he refused. She finally broke down his resistance and was about to succumb to her desires. However, at the last moment, he regained his defiance, and she grabbed onto his cloak, trying to stop him from leaving. But he ran out of the house, leaving his cloak in her hand. Now, she used that cloak as proof that, and when she accused him of trying to rape her. This incident brought about his incarceration. The story continues with him interpreting Paro's dream. After successfully doing so, Paro appoints him viceroy, the second most powerful position in Egypt. The incident with his brothers where they forcibly removed the Kasonis Pasin, the coat of many colors, and then the incident with his mistress, where she forcibly removed his cloak, were the catalyst that brought him to the elevated position of Viceroy of Egypt. It was then that Paro had dressed him in what we say big day chase, in the finest linen garments, dress for success. These fine linen garments are an allusion to the fine linen garments that a regular priest would wear in his service at the temple. The high priest was also dressed in linen gardens, garments in addition to the special golden vestments that he wore. Now these linen garments were white, an allusion to purity and holiness that a priest must attain and retain in order for him to fulfill his mission as a representative of the people before God Almighty. The gold investments that the high priest wore were meant to evoke a feeling of awe in the people when they would gaze at him. After all, he was God's representative on earth, which made him the spiritual leader of the Jewish nation. These eight vestments also function as an atonement for certain types of sins. The breastplate, the kosher mishpat, atoned for faulty judgment. The ephod, a kind of apron, atoned for idol worship. The me'il, a robe, atoned for lush and hara, tail bearing. The kasonis tashbes, the tunic, a kind of shirt worn next to the skin, atoned for bloodshed. The mitznefes, the hat, atoned for arrogance. The avnet, the belt, atoned for sins of the heart. The mitnosayim, the pants, atoned for immorality. And the tzitz, the gold headband, atoned for audacity. Now the pants, the mitnosayim, were the first thing that the high priest put on, and the tzitz, the headband, was the last. The pants that the high priest wore were necessary for the sake of modesty, which also indicates man's imperfection. Before one begins any endeavor, it is essential that he clothe himself in modesty and humility. Now the tzitz, this golden hand headband, had written on it the words in Hebrew, Kodesh Lashem, holy to God. This was the last thing that the high priest put on to signify that in the end, everything that we have, all successes that we achieve can be attributed only to God Almighty. The Ramban, Nachmanides, states that by wearing these garments, the wearer would enjoy glory and splendor in the eyes of all those who saw him. Yosef was a spiritual leader, leader of the family, and it was only proper that he would clothe him to be clothed in linen garments. 
The sages tell us that the Jewish nation was redeemed from slavery in Egypt in the merit of three things. They didn't change their language, their names, or their dress. It's a strange statement. Uh, does that really mean that they all spoke Hebrew? All of them were named Chaim, and they all dressed in long black jackets, white shirts, and black hats? <laughs> no, I don't think so. But what it does mean is that though they spoke Egyptian, their speech was not vulgar. They made sure not to name their children after pagan idols. And they dressed in Egyptian clothing, but it was proper and respectful. So again, we see the importance of clothing. In the book of Amidbar, in the portion of Chukat, at the beginning of chapter 21, it says that the Canaanites heard that Aaron, the high priest, had died, and that the clouds of glory that were in his honor had departed. And so they attacked the nation. Rashi tells us they were really the tribe of Amalek, the first nation to attack the Jews in the desert after they left Egypt. Rashi says that they changed their language so that the Israelites would pray to God to save them from the Canaanites, which was the language they were speaking in, not the Amalekis, who they actually were. Rashi then continues with his commentary and says that the Israelites were able to see by their clothing that they were not Canaanites. So Rabbi Yitzhak of Orca asks, simple question, if they were trying to mislead the Jews, why didn't the Amalekis change their clothing also? Why just their language? And he answered, because if they would have changed their language and their dress, that would have changed their nature. Again, we see the importance of clothing. At the beginning of our day, we begin by reciting what we call the Birchat HaShachar, the morning blessings. We thank God from one of them for Malbush, Malbush HaRumen, he who closes, clothes the naked. As we put on our shoes, we say, She'asali called Sarki, who has provided me with all my needs. Clothes are treated with respect. We even have a blessing on purchasing and wearing a new garment for the first time. We do not put on or take off two articles of clothing together. And the right side always takes precedent to the left side. In fact, there is even a special way that we tie and put on our shoes. There's a story told of a uh, family <clears throat> who had missed their bus on Friday, Arab Shabbos at the bus station in Tel Aviv, and they needed to get to Jerusalem. And as they were standing outside the bus station, not knowing what to do, a young man, 17-year-old boy, pulled up and asked them if they needed a ride. And of course, they were glad to say yes. And very kindly, he drove them all the way to their house in Jerusalem. And when they reached the house, the man of the house, the religious uh, uh, man, said to this Israeli secular young boy, he was ready to leave. He said, why don't you stay? It's already, it's almost Shabbat. Why don't you stay with us for Shabbat? And the young man kind of said no. He really wasn't religious and really wasn't interested. But the husband insisted and pushed him and finally he agreed. And he spent the whole Shabbat with the family. And he even stayed for a Malaba Malka after Shabbos was over. And when it was all said and done, he turned to his host and he said, you know, this was wonderful, really. I, I really, really enjoyed myself. And I would like to do a mitzvah, some good deed to remember this. But I want to do something. My friends won't chide me about it. After all, I don't, I'm not religious and I don't hang around people that are. So do you have one mitzvah that I could do? Just one. And the husband thought for a minute, and he smiled, and he said, yeah, I have one for you, and this should be fine for you. He said, we have a, a law in the Shulchan Aruch that we put on our right shoe first, then we put on our left, and then we tie our left shoe first, and then we tie our right. So one more time, put on our right, then our left, tie our left, and then our right. And the young man looked at him and said, that's it? And he said, yeah, we show proper respect. And he smiled and he said, that's great, that's perfect. And he went on his way. Just so happened as all the Israelis, he had turned 18 and was automatically drafted into the Israeli army. And when he was in basic, uh, he still made it a point. Every, day, every time he put on his shoes, he would put on the right first, then the left, tie the left, and then the right. And if he forgot, then he would just take them off and start all over again. And it happened quite a few times at the beginning, but he got the hang of it for the most part. 
just so happened that one day they were going out for maneuvers and they were on the parade field and he realized he had put on his combat boots and forgot to put on the right and left and then tie the left. But he knew if he told the captain what he wanted to do to take them off and go put them back on that the captain would have an issue. So he told the captain that he had a migraine. He wanted to go back to the barracks to uh, get some aspirin. And the captain said, hurry up, because they were getting ready to leave on maneuvers. He went back and took off his combat boots, put on the right, the left, tied the left, and then the right, and hurried back to the parade field. But he got there late. His company had already left, and the uh, squad was on a uh, helicopter. Just so happened that day, two Israeli helicopters collided in midair. 73 Israeli young soldiers were killed. He wasn't one of them. He never got on that helicopter. And we see how just a simple thing can be so important. We know that God did not allow Moshe, our teacher, to enter the land of Israel. Not even his bones. Not even his bones were allowed to enter the land. The Torah tells us that when Yisrael's daughters described Moshe, when they first met him, to their father Yisrael, they called him an Ish Mitzri, an Egyptian man. He was dressed like an Egyptian. When the butler described Yosef to Paro, he calls him a Nar Ivri, a Jewish young man. And since Moshe allowed himself to be seen as an Egyptian, even his bones were not buried in the land of Israel. But Yosef, who kept his identity open and visible for all to see, his bones were buried in the city of Shechem, in the land of Israel. Now, clothing are a major factor in Jewish life. The Torah commands us to maintain a spiritual and physical purity. If one is required to purify themselves in a mikvah, they are also required to wash the clothing that touch their defiled body. We are also commanded to wear special clothing on Shabbat and Yom Tov, festive garments. Now, special individuals such as a king wear garments that tell others of their royal status. This may be why we have a color called royal blue. It is interesting that we are commanded to place tzitzit, fringes, on any material garment that we wear that has four corners. The tzitzit are made up of material of white and blue, either linen or wool, which allude to our elevated status as children of the king. It was a custom of royalty to wear special garments, and so God has commanded us to wear a tzitzit, a special garment, a sign of our elevated position. Now, the blessing that we make when we put on our four-cornered gar gar garment, the tzitzit, is lehis atet b'tzitzit, which translates to mean to wrap ourselves in the fringes. And but we are putting on a talit, a prayer shawl. Why wouldn't the blessing read lehis atet b'talit, to wrap yourself in a talit? Because that's what we're really doing. After all, the tzitzit, are only a minor part of the garment. And yet we refer to the fringes, to the, tal to the tzitzit, and not the talit. Why? So the answer seems to be, even though the tzitzits are secondary in regard to size, but in Judaism, size is not always the deciding factor. The tzitzit are attached to the four corners of the garment and are therefore often dragged on the ground. Humility. There is little in this world that God appreciates more than humility. And so the blessing is on the tzitzit and not on the talit. You know, we read the story about David Amel, King David, in Shmuel 25.5, where he was running for his life from King Shaul. Shaul was trying to kill him. He hid in the cave, and it happened that unknowingly, King Shaul was taking a nap in the same exact cave that David was hiding in. While King Shaul was asleep, David stealthily came and cut off a corner of his royal garment. He did so to show King Shaul that he could have killed him, but that he chose not to. In David's later years, he was punished for his lack of regard for King Shaul's royal garment. It seemed that he was constantly cold, and no matter how much clothing he put on, he could not warm himself. So if we are expected to show respect to clothing, how much more so should we show respect to those who wear them. There are laws connecting to clothing that show possible signs of leprosy, which is a spiritual leprosy, unlike the physical condition referred to as leprosy. This is a sign from heaven 
that a person has sinned and needed to correct their ways. It is a physical manifestation of a spiritual deficiency. Now, there are laws of mourning, whereby a close relative is required to tear their clothing as a sign to others that they are in the first seven days of the mourning period for their loved one. There is a law for one to dress up in special clothing for the Shabbat and Yom Tovim. On Yom Kippur, there is a custom to dress in a white kittle, a robe, as a sign of purity. We spend the day in prayer and we fast, hoping that God will see us on the level of angels and forgive all of our sins. Clothes are also a sign of glory. According to Hasidus, thought, speech, and action are the garments of the soul, and they are considered even more holy than the soul itself. A king is honored by the clothing that he wears. It gives him a sense of royalty and majesty. So to a judge who wears a special robe to add dignity to the position. Many professionals are recognizable by the uniform they wear. Policemen, nurses, doctors, postal workers, priests, nuns, even prisoners, etc. Their uniform describes their position and gives them credibility. So, so why do we wear clothes? <laughs> I guess one reason is so that we don't get arrested for indecent exposure. Hmm. All kidding aside, our clothes make a major statement as to who we are and how we want people to interact with us. Somehow, we all find our, our own style. You know, it amazes me in how we all dress in some unique, unique way. We're all different. Even those who are religious somehow find something different or special in their manner of dress. Dressing in religious clothing is making a statement that you are an Orthodox Jew. That statement comes with responsibility. You are, in a sense, an ambassador of God. When religious men and women dress in a proper and dignified manner, it is a sanctification of God's name, what we might call a Kiddush Hashem. It also saves them from situations that they might find tempting or outright vulgar, a protective fence against evil. On the other hand, there's a concept in Jewish law that is called marit ayin, what people see. When our actions or dress give people the impression that we are doing something wrong, even though it is only conceptual, it is forbidden. We even need to be aware of those actions that can be misinterpreted. We always should be open and transparent, as is prudent. We also see it before a priest, a kohen, would officiate, he would wash his hands and feet from the water drawn from the key of the wash basin. It was made out of the mirrors of the righteous women who used their mirrors to seduce their husbands in the apple orchards in Egypt, even though Paro was killing their babies. Before a priest would officiate, he would look at himself in these mirrors to make sure that his clothing was clean and fit properly. People most often treat you much the same as you treat yourself. Dressing properly, what we call sneas, modesty, saves us from a lot of challenges in life. We are all human. Why put yourselves, ourselves in situations where we have to fight with our illicit passions? If we don't advertise, then we don't have to deal with unwanted customers. Now, I find it interesting in this Me Too age that many women walk around advertising their assets, and then when men approach them, they are taken back highly insulted. If they dressed modestly, they wouldn't have to deal with much of the harassment. More often than not, we create our own problems. You know, the Hebrew word for clothing is beged. It is spelled Bez Gimel Dalet. These are the second, third, and fourth letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Whenever we use the last letters of the Hebrew alphabet, it alludes to judgment and severity, such as the month of Tishrei, the month of judgment, which is made up of the last three letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Whenever we use the first letters of the Hebrew alphabet, it alludes to kindness and mercy. As we see, the first word of the Torah begins with a bays, second letter in the Hebrew alphabet, which we say alludes to the Hebrew word baracha, blessing, and so to the word beged, which begins with the bays, and comes from the beginning of the alphabet, tells us that clothing were given to mankind as a blessing. Clothes have the ability to bestow honor and glory on the individual who wears them or not. In addition, 
The gamati of the word Beged, 2, 3, and 4, equals 9. As I've mentioned before, the number 9 alludes to truth, emet. Whether we realize it or not, many times, the way that we dress tells the world the truth about who and what we are. And if our clothes lie about who we are, hmm, then our mouths will usually let the truth out. In Aesop Fables, they tell a story about the monkey, pardon me, about the donkey and the lion's skin. They tell the story there was a donkey who came upon the carcass of a dead lion the hunters had left in the, in the bush to rot. So the donkey climbed into the dead carcass of the lion and walked into his village. When the villagers saw him coming, they all fled in fright. <laughs> he was ecstatic. He was so happy that he let out a loud and long bray. When the villagers heard his bray, not a roar, they realized that it was not a lion, but a donkey in lion skin. They beat him soundly for scaring them. Fine clothes made disguise, but silly words will disclose a fool. May God bless us that we have the wisdom to dress ourselves in clothing that protect who we are and inspire us to be who we should be. May our clothes be reflections of those positive traits that help us to reach inner tranquility and goodness. And with that, may we help to usher in the coming of Mashiach Sikainu quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. God bless you all. Be safe. Be happy. And God should bless you with only good. Shabbat Shalom.